Good afternoon, everybody. If I can have your attention and invite whoever is seated at the, at the back of the hall, you're welcome to join us up front here. Um, welcome to the Leo Beck Institute at the center of the Jewish history. My name is Markus Kahr. I'm the executive director of the Leo Beck Institute, and I'm very delighted to welcome you all. Um, we are happily surprised that so many of you are interested in the Hebrew translation of a 200-year-old book. Um, so welcome. Uh, I think we will have a wonderful afternoon. You may know that the Leo Beck Institute, as one of the partners of the Center for Jewish History, has the mission to preserve and make relevant German Jewish history, or the history and culture of German-speaking Jews, which includes, obviously, Moses Mendelssohn. And uh, this event is very much along what we do, if only for one reason, which I want to show you on the screen, because the Leo Beck Institute actually owns Mendelssohn's glasses. So we don't know for sure when they were manufactured, but we would like to think, and I would like you to think that he wore them when he wrote Jerusalem. Um, they are part of LBI's collections, which form the basis of everything we do. We support scholarship. We try to promote the importance of German Jewish history to broader audiences, most recently with our podcast called Exile, narrated by Mandy Patinkin. And we really try to show the entire breadth and depth and width of German Jewish history, going all the way back to medieval times and therefore also including Mendelssohn. And I'm very happy that we can have this event today with um, such illustrious co-sponsoring institutions. Um, I want to thank those people who are involved in making this happen. I cannot mention everybody by name, but I want to highlight the, the institutions who um, who have made this possible, but before I do that, let me first point you to the distinguished panel of speakers. They will all be introduced in a moment. Thank you for coming, thank you for your contributions. The speakers all represent uh, one of the institutions which have co-sponsored this event, and um, I just go through them in no particular order, saying thank you to Hebrew Union College, the Jewish Institute of Religion, the Handel Center for Jewish Ethics and Justice of the Jewish Theological Seminary, my alma mater, so a shout out to JTS here, the Bernard Revel Graduate School of Yeshiva University. I don't know if I'm making too much of this, but there are not that many events which are co-sponsored by the rabbinical seminaries of all three denominations, so I'm glad that we could make that happen. I want to thank the Carmel Publishing House, which is the publisher of the Hebrew translation of Jerusalem. I want to thank the staff and the, um, everybody um, at LDI and the Center for Jewish History who made this possible. And I saved for last the initiators of this event um, who are of particular importance um, representing the Skirball Department of Hebrew and Judaic Studies of NYU, which was the driving force behind this event, represented by two people on the panel. I will start with Jonathan Green at the far end of the panel, doctoral candidate in modern Jewish thought, who will be introduced as a member of the panel in a moment, and uh, Professor Michael Gottlieb, um, who will introduce the speaker, so I'll introduce him and then turn it over to him. Um, I'm sure most of you will know Michael Gottlieb, so I will be brief. Michael is a professor of modern Jewish philosophy, um, has focused on um, philosophy starting with Spinoza and has particular emphasis on Mendelssohn um, with his uh, 2011 book, Faith and Freedom, Moses Mendelssohn's political, polit uh, Theological Political Thought and his latest award-winning book, The Jewish Reformation, Bible Translation and Middle Class German Judaism as Spiritual Enterprise. Michael, I'll turn it to you. Thank you all for coming and I look forward to an exciting event. Thank you. Okay. So I really want to thank you, Marcus. Uh, this event would have not have happened without you and with LBI's support, and we are very, very grateful for it and for the collaboration that you've shown. I uh, really appreciate it. So a few years ago, Alan Arkush wrote an article that he called Moses Mendelssohn Street. 
And what Arkish observed in this article was that in Jerusalem, there's no street that's named after the person who's often considered to be the founder of modern Judaism. Um, now, this is doubly ironic because Mendelssohn articulated his philosophy in a work that was called Jerusalem. So why this neglect of Moses Mendelssohn in Israel? So Arkush laid a hypothesis. His hypothesis was that it went back to the 19th century to this Jewish nationalist that wrote in the third quarter of the 19th century named Peretz Smolenskin. And in a series of writings, Smolenskin cast Mendelssohn as an evil man. And he cast Mendelssohn as someone who was responsible for generating the dangerous idea that Jews are a religious group and not a nation. Well, Smolenskin's assertions were actually false. Uh, Mendelssohn repeatedly called Jews a nation. He advocated for reviving the Hebrew, Hebrew as a living language. And he affirmed the messianic hope that Jews would return to their ancestral homeland. And he saw this as a distinguishing mark of Judaism. But it didn't matter. Uh, among the Zionists, Smolenskin's view became gospel. 240 years have passed since Mendelssohn published Jerusalem. And today, we come to celebrate Professor Shmuel Feiner's new Hebrew edition of it. Now, Professor Feiner notes that his is not the first translation of Jerusalem into Hebrew. Already in 1789, just three years after Mendelssohn's death, his disciple Isaac Oitel published a partial translation of Jerusalem in his biography of Moses Mendelssohn. 17 years later, 70 years later, the Ukrainian Maskil Avram Ber Gottlober published the first full Hebrew translation of Jerusalem. And a decade after that, in 1876, Svi Hirsch Greenbaum published another, a second full translation of Jerusalem into Hebrew. Now, Greenbaum was an interesting figure because he was actually a Jewish convert to Christianity. And he removed passages from Jerusalem in which Mendelssohn criticized Christianity. But even more surprising was the publisher, the press that published this book. Who was it? Not other than Smolenskin's press. Why did Smolenskin do this? Did he think that it's important to know thine enemy? Perhaps... Smolenskin had a deeper reason for having a Jewish convert to Christianity translate Jerusalem. Right? Perhaps Smolenskin was suggesting that by removing the national elements of Judaism and stressing love of humanity as the core teaching of Judaism, Mendelssohn paved the way for Jews to abandon Judaism, to convert to Christianity, which four of his six children famously did. So was this translation... In was Wes Molenskin's enlisting a Jewish convert to Christianity to translate Jerusalem, a way of telegraphing a message of what's the end point of this book, of this philosophy? The third full Hebrew translation appeared in 1947, and it was published in Palestine by Shlomo, and it was translated by Shlomo Herberg. So this really marks out what is really distinctive and really a landmark achievement of Professor Feiner's wonderful new uh, edition of Jerusalem. First of all, it's the first Hebrew rendering of Jerusalem in 75 years, and it's the first Hebrew rendering that was published in the state of Israel. The full title of Mendelssohn's book is Jerusalem or On Religious Power and Judaism. And Professor Feiner is particularly interested in the second part of this title. For one of Mendelssohn's main objectives in Jerusalem is to argue that it's always wrong to seek to coerce religious obedience and conformity. In Mendelssohn's time, it was common for Christians to argue that coercion was a defining feature of Judaism. Didn't the Bible stipulate that 
that the person who violated the Sabbath had to be stoned to death. But in, Men but in Jerusalem, Mendelssohn argued that not only is religious coercion always immoral, it also contradicts what he conceives of as true Judaism. And as we'll hear, Professor Feiner finds Mendelssohn's me message more relevant than ever today. So we have a very special program here. Uh, as was remarked, we have all these co-sponsors of the Leo Beck, Skirball, and Hebrew Union College, Jew the Jewish Theological Seminary, and Yeshiva University. Uh, and as Marcus was suggesting, I, mean, I can't really think of another modern figure that all three major mainstream American Jewish denominations can look to as their founder in some sense. So it's really uh, uh, an amazing occasion. So with that, it's a real honor to introduce our speakers today. Shmuel Feiner is Professor Emeritus of Modern Jewish History at Bar Ilan University. He's Chairman of the Historical Society of Israel and former Chairman of the Leo Beck Institute in Jerusalem. His most recent work includes The Jewish, in, the Jewish 18th Century, which is two volumes, uh, and published uh, by Indiana University Press, as well as this wonderful new translation of Jerusalem. Shira Billet is Assistant Professor of Jewish Thought and Ethics at JTS and the Academic Director of JTS's Handel Center for Ethics and Justice. Her forthcoming, her forthcoming book chapter, Let the Historian Be a Philosopher, Herman Cohen's Methodological Dispute with Spinoza, will be published in July. She's currently completing a monograph on Herman Cohen's philosophical ethics and Jewish thought. Leah Hoffman is Associate Professor of Jewish Thought at HUC JIR in Los Angeles, and she serves as the director of the Lauheim School for Judaic Studies. Her works include The Ugliness of Moses Mendelssohn, Aesthetics, Religion, and Morality in the 18th Century, Scriptions, Jewish Thought on COVID-19, and Reforming Judaism, Moments of Disruption in Jewish Thought. Jonathan Green, is a doctoral candidate in modern Jewish thought at the Skirball Department of Hebrew and Judaic Studies at NYU. He's writing his dissertation on Moses Mendelssohn's intervention in this very critical debate in the 18th century about the value of luxury in the modern world. And this is, no one has really treated this subject at all. Um, at the past AGS conference, he spoke at, about his research in a paper called the Bible's Wisdom on the Arts and Sciences, Mendelssohn versus Maimonides. Uh, Marcus mentioned uh, myself and Jonathan Green as organizers of this. That's a bit of an exaggeration. It was really Jonathan Green who did this. Um, he spent uh, countless hours on this, and we're all very grateful to you, Jonathan, for putting together such an amazing program. <laughs> Finally, Jacob J. Schachter is the University Professor of Jewish History and Jewish Thought and a senior scholar at Reitz at Yeshiva University. He was recently honored with the publication of a festschrift titled Emmet Yaakov, Facing Truths of History, Essays in Honor of Jacob J. Schachter. So now let me just say briefly the program of our, uh, the format of our program and then we'll begin. So we'll start with a 15 minute lecture by Professor Feiner. This is then going to be followed by responses by Professors Billet, Hochman, and Jonathan Green. And following that, we'll have time for Q&A from the audience. Then we'll end with a concluding reflection from Professor J.J. Schachter. So without further ado, let's begin. Um, and the title of Professor Feiner's talk is Mendelssohn's Jerusalem and the Jewish Vision of Tolerance. Please join me in welcoming Professor Shmuel Feiner. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Thank you very much for this kind invitation, Micha, and for the hospitality. I really feel at home here among friends, colleagues, and guests. And thank you also for uh, op the opportunity to escape for a little while from the turmoil in my country to cross the ocean 
and to delve into the 18th century. But as you are going to see, it is not entirely an escape, but more accurate, reaching out deeply into the origins of some of the most urgent questions of our time, namely religious and political tolerance. Moses Mendelssohn wrote Jerusalem uh, and with his, uh, okay. with his back to the wall. His Jewish identity and liberal opinions were challenged in the public sphere of German enlightenment. And this was his last opportunity to write a book that would preserve the essence of his faith and his values as the first modern Jewish humanist for the following generations. His book, ranging from apologetics for his faith to political and religious philosophy, was, was first of all a daring essay that entirely negated the rule of religion and advocated tolerance and freedom of thought. Let everyone be permitted to speak as he thinks, to invoke God after his own manner or that of his fa fathers, and to seek eternal salvation where things he may find, as long as he does not disturb public felicity and acts honestly towards the civil law, toward you and his fellow citizens. I think this is a um, declaration of, uh, of faith by Moses Mendelssohn. But the book was written in a very specific context. In the summer of 1783, seven years after the resounding protests against tyranny and for freedom and equality voiced in the American Declaration of Independence, and less than six years before the French Revolution, but just two years and two months before Mendelssohn's death, the man known as the German Socrates published one of the classic documents in Jewish modernity. The years 1781-1782 were particularly moving and faithful for Mendelssohn. The play by his friend Lessing, Nathan the Wise, Nathan the Wise was published arousing great excitement, offering the chance that Christian Europe might be right to acknowledge the differences in religion were secondary to the natural rights of man. And in his work of 1781 on the civil improvement of the Jews, Christian Wilhelm von Dom had taken this idea and shown how it was possible to create an utopia by carrying out a plan of action for which the state would be responsible. In German public opinion, a lively dispute began as to whether the plan to reform Jews and include them in the state was possible. And, without, and within a few months, it seemed that as if, if the plan had already passed from the theoretical stage to that of implementation. In October 1781, the court of the Emperor Joseph II issued the first decree of tolerance of the Jewish communities of the Habsburg Empire. The new ruler, as an enlightened absolutist, had recently succeeded his mother, Maria Teresa, and was determined to implement a policy of religious toleration and reform for the benefit of all his subjects. Like Don, he believed in the possibility of reforming the Jews and training them for citizenship. Far less prominent but highly significant for Mendelssohn was the conflict in the Jewish community of Altona in that year, in 1781 between the agent of the stock exchange in Hamburg, Nathaniel Posner, and its rabbi, the rabbi of the community, Raphael Cohen. This conflict began with Posner's public 
defiance of the instructions of the oral law and his demand that community should neither intervene in his way of life nor impose religious norms on him. This led to the outbreak of an episode that was even brought before the Danish authorities who ruled Altona that, uh, at the time and for a decision and it was reported in the press, it became a well-known affair, the conflict over Netan and Posner. Posner was threatened with excommunication if he did not repent from its, its denial of obeying her authority and abandon his free lifestyle as a fly denken. This was a critical test for the rabbinical authority. Rabbi Raphael Cohen addressed the Danish authorities and asked them to authorize is right to communicate as a means of guaranteeing religious uh, discipline. German public op opinion learned about the incident from the report of the independent author August Friedrich Kranz, a vigorous adversary of religious fanaticism. He wanted Denmark to offer protection to a Jew whom the rabbis wished to harm and opposed religious fanaticism, which in his opinion lo longer suited the enlightened 18th century. In those circumstances, as well as the establishment uh, of the first modern, uh, uh, <coughs> ex excuse me, I skipped the uh, uh, and he, the same, uh, uh, the same class, he, actually uh, challenge the entire uh, world of Moses Mendelssohn as we are going to see uh, in, a few, uh, in a few minutes. So in these circumstances, as well as the establishment of the first modern Jewish school in Berlin, the Jewish Free School uh, in, uh, in, in 1778, and the formation of the Haskalah movement in Königsberg, the Society for the Promotion of the Hebrew language in 1782, founded by Isaac Oike, the first biographer and the first translator, actually, of Mendelssohn Jerusalem, not surprisingly that Mendelssohn was in a, f in a fine mood. In early 1782, with, in Sudbiyah, he wrote in the introduction to his translation of Menasseh ben Israel, The Vindication of the Jews, and he said the following. Thanks to the beneficent, beneficent providence, toward the end of my day, I was yet able to experience this fortunate point in time when people finally began to adopt and implement human rights to the true extent. Following Dom's writing, he believed that a decisive turning point had been reached in the blood-soaked relation between Jews and Christians. The wise man of the world of the 18th century, meaning Dom, uh, was about the differences among doctrines and opinions and looked only at man as a human being. The introduction can be read as a liberal call for the un unconditional granting of civil rights to the Jews without paying the price, as it were, for reform an improvement demanded by Dom and Joseph II. Mendelssohn had a different idea. He didn't believe that emancipation is conditioned by any change in Jewish life. It can also be read as a polemic, angrily attacking the secularization of the prejudices against the Jews, who are now presented not as enemies of Christianity, but as allies to sophisticated and refined European culture. Mendelssohn believed that the Jewish question was the touchstone for the principles of the Enlightenment and for the overcoming of prejudices and religious fanaticism, everything that he angrily called barbarism. Mendelssohn had called for removing the, the punishment of excommunication from the hands of the Jewish leadership he regarded it as, as an expression of extreme fanaticism and called monast uh, monsters. 
I keep silent, he said, regarding the danger entailed by calling such a right of expansion for its misuse, which such a right of excommunication, as with any ecclesiastical punishment of power, is unavoidable. Ha, in a few centuries, the human race will not yet recover from the white pleasures received this monster, this monster administrated. I see no possibility, say, to when enforce religious sin as long as it finds that this path open before it. <clears throat> Mendelssohn apparently did not expect that the, that the introduction would cause him serious problems. But then the pamphlet, The Searching for Light and Right, was published, and he was in distress. It was addressed personally to him and was like a sharp arrow piercing his heart. Mendelssohn words in favor of religious tolerance in the introduction and rejecting religious coercion were interpreted, inter interpreted as a step toward Christianity. Mendelssohn composed Jerusalem against those arguments in emotional turmoil with a feeling of urgency and, and, and injury. He wrote that the arguments leveled against him and struck his heart. But this was also an opportunity to formulate his ideas with great clarity. The individual freedom of conscience was in his view the most precious treasure of humanity, which must be defended absolutely. As in the introduction, he categorically condemned the religious punishment of excommunication he said, reader to whatever visible church, uh, synagogue, or mosque you may belong, see if you do not find more true religion among the hosts of the excommunicated than among the far greater hosts of those who excommunicated them. So Jerusalem did not offer a compromise, a middle ground solution, as we sometimes believe a middle ground solution for the tension between religion and the state and to the world between uh, and to the world between old and new in which the Jews were caught in the modern age. His position was firm and in, con in the context of his time even radical. Regarding the war against religious fanaticism, church power, excommunication and religious conversion, Mendelssohn mounted the barricades and appears in the figure of a daring Jewish revolutionary. In his view, the conflict between religion and state was dangerous for the entire human race. Everything must be done that in the new era of enlightenment, barbarism, a term that he uh, uh, repeatedly uh, uh, mentioned, barbarism would not wear its ugly head. The clergy must not have even a hint of coercive power, compromise and re reconciliation between secular and ecclesiastical authority ultimately comes at the price of freedom of conscience, and it is also dangerous. Toward the end of uh, uh, writing Jerusalem, news reached him from America about a proposal to establish a religion, and he reached and, and reacted with disappointment adding a final footnote. Alas, we already hear the Congress in America striking up the old tune and speaking of a, dom as a dominant religion. For him, it was almost a disaster. Madison's harsh criticism of various forms of oppression and prejudices, superstitions and cruelty, turned Jerusalem from an apology of the Jewish religion into a masterpiece of European enlightenment, making its author the first Jewish humanist. This was not a naive response to the challenges of the modern age for humanity in general and for the Jews in particular. 
Rather, it was an urgent call for reform by eliminating the power of religious coercion and acknowledging the liberty of all human beings and the ability to improve their life and understand its meaning through reason. It was also a call for a true Judaism that would enable modern Jews to retain their cultural identity. In the 21st century, when the values of the Enlightenment are under attack from several directions, Mendelssohn is more relevant than ever. And I really highly appreciate that uh, uh, this evening when we can reflect on Mendelssohn's children when in our mind all the time our own problem of the 21st century and he is and Manson seems so relevant. And I must admit that I often, and especially after October the seventh, find myself repeating the strong words of one of Manson's last letters, where his dreams and nightmares are mixed. We dwell of nothing but the enlightenment and believe that the light of reason which so intensely illuminate the environment that delusions and, and enthusiastic fanaticism could no longer be seen. But as we can see from the other side of the horizon, nighttime with all of its ghosts and demons is already falling. More frightening than anything is that evil, evil is so active and potent, delusion and fanaticism are acting while reason contents itself with talk. And I believe there is no way to explain the current meaning of those radical um, sentence written by Moses Madison in 1784. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we have a, uh, a handout that uh, Professor Billet has um, distributed. So I now call up uh, Professor Shira Billet. Um, it's an honor to be here to mark the occasion of this wonderful new Hebrew edition of Mendelssohn's Jerusalem. And I just want to thank Jonathan Green, Professor Mika Gottlieb, uh, the organizers, as well as Professor Feiner for uh, organizing and editing this work and also um, that wonderful talk. So at the end of the 18th century and into the 19th century, translating Mendelssohn's work into Hebrew was a commonplace activity for philosophically minded Jewish intellectuals. Most often, it was Mendelssohn's great platonic dialogue, Fidon, Fidon, um, but this was largely a private act of self-edification that was engaged in, not for publication. We did hear from Professor Gottlieb also about a few publications of Jerusalem in particular in Hebrew that happened over the centuries. Um, but this was a private act of self-edification. And um, I want to just contrast that with this volume, which is translated into Hebrew today. Um, and as Professor Gottlieb pointed out, for the first time, um, also in the time that Hebrew is the language of a nation state. And so it has very different connotations. It's bringing a text to a public, the Israeli public and a Jewish public more broadly. Um, I'll note that when this translation arrived in the bookstores in Israel, um, Israel was in the midst of a constitutional crisis and um, the most intense period of political polarization that the country had experienced. And um, I think that's very significant for how we receive Mendelssohn's work today. And really it's not just Israel, but it's the United States and most of the world um, that has been entangled with profound 
polarization, um, ideological polarization, um, the inability to talk to one another, the inability to reason with one another and to come to solutions and compromises in order to figure out how we can live together. And it's in that context that I just want to reflect on um, some of Mendelssohn's ideas that appear in this work. And I'll note also that um, the translation includes not only Jerusalem, but also the introduction to Mendelssohn's introduction to the translation that he commissioned of um, Menashe ben Israel's Vindication of the Jews, which has been mentioned, I believe, both by Professor Gottlieb and by Professor Feiner, but I just wanted to point out that that's also um, translated in the volume. Um, and so I want, I, on the handout, I have a few texts from Mendelssohn um, that reflect on ideas that I think relate to concerns we have today about how we have discourse with people who are really different from us, um, where there's intense disagreement and where the stakes are high. Um, and also, I want to pick up on um, where Professor Feiner ended off with, which is one of Mendelssohn's last letters where he expressed a tremendous amount of despair about the vision of enlightenment that he had um, been part of helping to establish through his friendship with Lessing and just through being part of the German Enlightenment, a, a central figure in the German Enlightenment um, in the late 18th century, and to think about um, as well the hope that Mendelssohn still had, despite that despair, uh, for how to move forward. So I hope everyone has a copy of the handout, and um, I only have a few moments, so I just want to um, point out a few of these texts. So source number one on the handout is from a letter that Mendelssohn wrote about Jerusalem, in which he described how the book had been kind of a disappointment for some readers. Um, and the reason why was that um, people, he says in the third sentence, for all expected religious squabble, whereas I, following my bad habit, look at every step for speculative, for speculative matters that can be tied in, and in doing so, I let the club drop. This displeases most, re most readers. But who does write for the readers? So Mendelssohn said that what people wanted was to see a big fight. They wanted to see him responding to the searcher um, who had publicly challenged him, and they wanted to see like a gladiator show. And Mendelssohn instead slowly and meticulously wrote a philosophical work. And while that was disappointing, I think Mendelssohn understood that his way was a better way for trying to pave a path forward. And I think that kind of slowing down and being willing to not give people the gladiator show that they are asking for is something that we lack um, too much in our moment today. Um, I'll skip to source number two is something that Professor Feiner mentioned in his note, just where um, describing Christian Wilhelm von Dohm, um, a, a friend of the Jews in, in complicated ways, but still a friend of the Jews who uh, pushed for their um, civil rights. Uh, Mendelssohn described him as an 18th century philosopher who set aside differences in doctrines and opinions and only considers the human in human beings. And in source number three, I brought um, some historical context that Alexander Altman, the most important scholar of Spinoza, uh, Spinoza of Mendelssohn, um, as we heard from Professor Gottlieb, who describes the writing of Jerusalem where we actually have Mendelssohn's original plan of the work. And in the original plan of the work, Mendelssohn was really angry and, and hurt and um, ready to lash out in more aggressive ways against Christianity. But then we have the book itself that was published, which is much calmer, which is much more um, amenable to the kind of discourse that he wanted to establish. So I think that's also something worth considering, that slowing down and not necessarily publishing um, what we're first thinking in our moments of deepest anger and hurt, but thinking about what will be conducive to uh, conversation and moving forward. And in source number four, um, this is from the earlier controversy that Mendelssohn 
experienced in his life. This was the first major controversy that he faced in the context of being publicly challenged to defend his Judaism, um, which is known as the Lavater Affair. And um, we don't have time to get into details, but that moment was really profoundly challenging for Mendelssohn and actually literally made him ill. Uh, a kind of illness that he suffered from for the rest of his life emerged in the context of um, just how difficult it was to be put in the position that he was in. But I bring here in source number four just um, something that Mendelssohn wrote in the context of that whole affair. Um, here describing a debate between Maimonides and Nachmanides in the Middle Ages, where they had a really deep and profound disagreement about the immortality of the soul for, in particular, for um, people who were really profound sinners, and where Maimonides thought that their souls were cut off, did not have immortality of the soul, and Nachmanides disagreed. But the part that I wanted to draw attention to is what Mendelssohn writes at the bottom there. He says, you must not believe that these religious teachers accuse one another of heresy because they differ on such important points. Not at all. Nachmanides defended Maimonides with incredible zeal when some zealots accused him of heresy after his death, and his writings were in danger of being burned. So what we have here is a model of profound ideological disagreement that does not include enmity and hatred. So turning now to the other side of the handout, um, from Jerusalem itself, the book that we're celebrating today. And this has to do with Mendelssohn's vision for a kind of pluralistic state, like the German state in which he lived. That he had a vision in particular of difference and disagreement, but where people can still live together. And what he disagreed with was an idea of some kind of harmony of everybody where, the, where difference was not preserved. Um, he wanted harmony, but not without difference. So he writes, there are some who want to persuade you that if only all of us had one and the same faith, we would no longer hate one another for reasons of faith, of the difference in opinion. That in such a case, religious hatred and the spirit of persecution would be torn up by their roots and extirpated. This view feigns brotherly love, effuses human tolerance, and secretly forges the fetters which it means to place on reason so that it may hurl it back again unawares into the cesspool of barbarism, that word we heard about from Professor Feiner, from which you have begun to pull it up. So he says there are some people who want to tell you that only if we all unify under one faith will human hatred end, and will we be able to have real brotherly love. But Mendelssohn had a vision for brotherly love slash human love and um, the ability to not hate one another, to not be en enemies with one another, but where we still have major differences and disagreements, and in his case, thinking about Jews um, preserving their Judaism. And so I want to uh, leave my remarks here with, uh, conclude my remarks here with just a reflection on Mendelssohn's view of history. We saw from Professor Feiner that Mendelssohn both um, expressed in his preface to the vindication of the Jews by Menashev in Israel that he was so grateful that he lived to this happy moment in time, this is source number six, when um, human beings are beginning to have enlightenment and to, be, and to begin to um, grant rights to people who are different from them. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, he describes in that very same text how the hatred of Jews has transformed with every moment of history into new versions and that the Enlightenment had its own new versions. So he both is grateful for the wonderful progress that has been made and he also sees that not very much progress has been made at all in a certain sense. And in source number seven, we have his view of history that he expresses in Jerusalem itself. Um, and in the interest of time, I, I won't read it, which you can do on your own time, but I'll just mention that Mendelssohn, in contrast with his friend Lessing, who he explicitly mentions here, who believed in progress, that humans were marching towards, humans and humanity as a collective was marching towards some progress that the Enlightenment was a stage of and would continue. Mendelssohn didn't think that was the case. He thought that in all periods of history, there's just as much evil 
in the world as there was at any other period in time. It's just that it moves around where it's located. It's distributed differently in different places, but the sum total is the same. That humanity as a whole does not make progress. Only individuals make progress, he says, in the course of the life of an individual. Um, so he has a more um, pessimistic view of history than other figures of the Enlightenment, and I think that it's because he was Jewish and experienced the situation of the Jews that he knew um, all of the flaws of the Enlightenment. He knew that as much as progress had been made, so much um, was also regressing, and I think that was what gave him this more pessimistic view of history. At the same time, he never gave up hope and he never stopped trying to put forth his contribution to helping improve the situation both for Jews and for humanity as a whole. And I'll just note that the way he died was um, in a moment of a kind of participating in, a very in what felt very urgent to him, a fight about the legacy of his friend Lessing. Um, and um, he died by kind of running out to, to get this text to the publisher in the midst of a rain, in a very bad weather situation that caused a chill or whatever, not known exactly what the causation is. But my main point is that's after he penned that letter that Professor Finer end with, where he has this um, profound expression of despair, that the demons are still there in the night, and yet he wasn't someone who ever stopped um, trying to do what he thought was right and what he thought would help make things better. And so I think that's a kind of model for um, hope, even with a vision that isn't just progress is happening, um, things are gonna get better in a kind of clear or linear way. Um, he still believed in the agency of human beings to act and to make things better. So I leave us with that and thank you again. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so now we'll hear from Professor Hoffman. First, I want to very much thank Dr. Michael Gottlieb and Jonathan Green, the Skirball Department of Hebrew and Judaic Studies at New York University, and Marcus Kroh and the Leo Beck Institute for extending the invitation for me to join this panel and for the opportunity to share reflections on the occasion of this historic translation of Mendelssohn's Jerusalem into Hebrew. It is a real delight for me to have a chance to talk about two intellectual heroes of mine, Mendelssohn and Feiner, and I'm grateful to Jonathan for the very heavy lift of organizing. As anyone who has ever planned a conference or a panel or a symposium or even a class speaker knows, organizing academics is far worse than herding cats. And he was quite unflappable in handling the many details of bringing together three seminarians and six academics, not just from downtown and uptown, but also from Israel and from the West Coast. I find it a very happy occasion to have a chance to, talk, to discuss Mendelssohn in the 18th century with such an esteemed panel of thinkers and such a full room of guests. Almost three decades ago, in what was my first academic talk, I spoke about Mendelssohn's aesthetics and attempted a case that linked his theories, still being uncovered and integrated into his Jewish output, to Maimonides' aesthetics, what I might call now proto-aesthetics, we were at Harvard at a graduate student conference on modern Jewish thought, history, and literature. And for me, it was really the first time I had a chance to hear other graduate students in Jewish studies talk about their work. There were folks from UCLA, Stanford, NYU, and Penn. And one by one, as they argued their points or just shared their discoveries or made their cases, they said almost to a person, some iteration of this phrase. As Professor Shmuel Feiner has said, do you remember that, the conference at Harvard? It was just after Haskalah and History was released. Dr. Feiner was at Harvard that year, and everyone seemed to know him and his, and his work and referred to him in incredibly glowing terms. I don't know if you remember that, but that stuck with me. Thus was my introduction, not just to the world of academia, but really 
to the incredible output in mind, as well as the graciousness and kindness of Dr. Shmuel Alfeiner. And so it is a deep honor to me to have this chance, quite belatedly, but no less genuinely, to use the same phrase in discussing Dr. Feiner's, Dr. Feiner's new edition of a translation of Jerusalem, and frankly, the translation of Mendelssohn himself into contemporary Hebrew. As Professor Shmuel Feiner has shown, the circumstances of Mendelssohn writing this work were actually ideal. He was at the top of his game, well known throughout Europe as erudite and gracious, an intellectual who was both a boundary pusher and an aspirational realist. Though plagued by the accusation that he was not really a Jew, or perhaps more accurately stated, irritated by the conundrum that his decades-long argument about the practice of principled religion being neither a hindrance to nor a subversion of natural religion had once again fallen victim to prejudice and what we might call weaponized incompetence in its view of Judaism. Mendelssohn was in the best possible position to say his piece. What Jerusalem tells us about Mendelssohn and the potential he saw in Judaism to exemplify Enlightenment ideals has been the topic of many valuable studies, some by the people in this very room. Mendelssohn was a wordsmith. He played fast and loose with the meaning of the words he chose, redefining authenticity, true, nature, Judaism in much the way that his hero, John Locke, would have understood and perhaps approved. Locke had provided the idea that words are, quote, but empty sounds and signs of our ideas, end, end quote, but not, as it were, the idea itself. That license to use a word, or perhaps a word sound, to indicate a deeper tapestry of meaning enabled Mendelssohn to develop the understanding that Judaism's ceremonial script is a language spoken by Jews to God, written in the semiotic practice of Jewish ritual and practice. It is still such an incredible idea. Judaism is a language. It is a language that requires the body to stimulate the mind. The gymnastics of the mind further the boundaries of our thinking and contemplation and appreciation and awestruckness of God. I will go further. Judaism is a poem, a sheer, and we should sing it, says Mendelssohn, because everything in it is just and good and moral and the root of the humanistic, humanistic principles with which Dr. Feiner began. That others were unable to hear the song or attempted to misuse it was, for Mendelssohn, willful misunderstanding an affront to the divine gift of reason that had graced his own life. With so much possibility and the flexibility afforded by language as depths and dynamism, the slipperiness in with which Mendelssohn changed the very nature of halachic Judaism is part of what makes the text so fascinating to read. Alan Arkish's translation of Jerusalem into English in 1983 opened that text to generations of readers made it accessible to legions of undergraduates, and sparked interest in the Jewish part of the Enlightenment for 40 years of Jewish thought scholarship. Professor Arkish tells a great story about how Alexander Altman tapped him to offer an updated philosophical, philosophically sophisticated English translation. And I have often wondered whether Altman modeled that ask on Mendelssohn's own deployment of younger scholars to achieve translation and commentary aims. Maybe so. It would make me appreciate Altman and Arkush even more than I already do. And that Dr. Feiner has continued that tradition in tapping a translator, an Israeli living in Germany, and providing an introduction and an essential contextualizing commentary continues that tradition begun with the Biur in the 18th century and carried now through the 21st century. As a lifetime beneficiary of that Arkish translation, it's impossible for me not to marvel and wonder at the impact Dr. Feiner's new Hebrew edition might have on the Hebrew reading public. 
The fear and anxiety invoked in the letter quoted at the end of today's talk, quote, we dreamt of nothing but the enlightenment and believed that the light of reason would so intensely illuminate the environment that delusions and enthusiastic fanaticism could no longer be seen. But as we can see from the other side of the horizon, nighttime, with all its ghosts and demons, is already falling. More frightening than anything is that evil is so active and potent. That letter feels almost cyclical in its prescience. Rather than a voice of doom, however, I hope that we can see Mendelssohn's Jerusalem in all of its available languages as the deeply critical and entirely hopeful text that it is, illuminating the darkness of a worldview that devalues the humanity of others and instead per propels its readers and their societies toward a multi-story building anchored not in the unequal dynamics of tolerance or toleration, but rather in the true spirit of mutual, harmonious, melodic songs of different people's equalities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, now we'll have our final respondent, uh, Jonathan Green. Very briefly, I want to also extend my uh, sincere thanks to Professor Feiner for the gift of his scholarship to Professors Feiner, Gottlieb, Billet, Hoffman, and Schachter, and Dr. Kraft for agreeing to participate in this event, and to all of you, our attentive audience today, uh, for joining us for some study, discussion, and celebration. Thank you. Professor Feiner's achievement of this translation represents the importance of there being a continued discussion of Mendelssohn in modern Jewish thought and in our contemporary circumstances. The questions raised by Jerusalem on the subject of tolerance of liberty and the relationship between religion and politics are undoubtedly relevant to us here in the United States as well as to Israelis, if in different ways. With this volume, Israelis can now find a more accessible Mendelssohn than before and can evaluate whether he speaks to them and to what the present and future hold. I have a couple of questions that I'd like to raise, uh, but in the interest of time, I'd like to focus on one point specifically uh, related to Professor Feiner's discussion of toleration, of reform, and of civil and religious authority. Uh, and this is a topic that stands at the center of my doctoral research. Mendelssohn's opposition to the punishment of communal excommunication, of cherem, by the Jewish leadership is often cited as the paradigm of his modern religious thought. Indeed, Professor Feiner writes that Mendelssohn regards it as an expression of extreme fanaticism and even monstrous. Yet one could ask, were there other areas where Mendelssohn resisted what he saw as flagrant religious overreach? Other battlegrounds for Mendelssohn that can give us a fuller picture of his position on the matter. I wish to lend further support to Professor Feiner's presentation by highlighting another area quite often overlooked where Mendelssohn rejects the authoritarianism of religious power. In its attempt to curtail the excessive attainment, consumption, and display of material goods, or what became known simply as luxury in the 18th century. Historically speaking, for centuries, both civil and religious authorities would resort to sumptuary laws to curtail the ownership or consumption of specific material goods and hence to block moral corruption from seeping in. Many Jewish communities of Europe enacted their own versions of sumptuary laws, often organized in their own self-governing enclaves. Early modern Jews had independent systems of communal ordinances, or takanot, some made by, by rabbinic bodies, and some by communities, associations, and other social organizations within the Jewish community at times with the approbation of the local rabbi. Some of these ordinances instituted limits or bans on luxury. Regulations were instituted to keep a check upon perceived luxuries of various kinds, such as jewelry, dress, decorations, 
food, uh, the size of your banquet guest list. And violating these regulations could trigger punishment, including corporal punishment, harassment, rebuke, humiliation, confiscation of the luxury item in question, uh, and even communal excommunication, or chera. Mendelssohn was concerned about the effects of luxury on his Jewish community and upon Europe generally. He had both moral and political concerns. He could have advocated for the instatement or the strengthening of sanctuary laws, that long familiar tactic of social control. Yet, as far as I've been able to tell, Mendelssohn avoids discussion of sanctuary laws. And once one pays attention, its absence is conspicuous. Granted, Mendelssohn's corpus is vast and my search is ongoing, but I have not yet seen him addressed in any of his major or minor writings. Lest one think that this is to make much ado about nothing, this would not be the first instance that scholars have seen where Mendelssohn's silence, his convenient and selective argumentation, appear to suggest a deeper motive. But even if one makes nothing of this apparent silence, Mendelssohn proposes many solutions to the problem of luxury, and significantly, none of them resort to the heavy hand of the coercive legal system. He relies neither on the regulations of non-Jewish sovereigns nor those of Jewish communal bodies. Rather, his solutions often involve the education of the human being. For example, by inculcating certain religious doctrines, by advancing the study of certain edifying texts, or supporting traditional moral norms. Why? Why is this? Why does he take this different approach? My contention is that Mendelssohn's non-coercive prescriptions for addressing the problem of luxury could be seen as part of this larger polemic against religious coercive power and his general notion of a liberal, progressive politics. In Jerusalem, Mendelssohn advocates for tolerance and freedom by challenging the religious establishment and its political power. Mendelssohn's concern with the problem of luxury, which can be found only briefly in Jerusalem, although in many other writings, too, in a more significant manner, as a, as a new layer to Mendelssohn's hostility to religious power, and his concern with the ethical and political flourishing of the Jews in a society, which will come through a freedom from religious coercion and a freedom to act virtuously. For Mendelssohn, religion must rule us in a new way, Religion becomes the arm of moral instruction, and it must take on a new role in our material lives as well. In fact, there's a tension here worth noting. On the one hand, Mendelssohn's resistance to coercive measures to resolve the luxury problem is in keeping with Mendelssohn's progressive tendency to redefine the role of religion, as we've discussed. On the other hand, his opposition to luxury reveals a certain traditional moral sensibility that sets him apart from certain enlightenment, a certain enlightenment camp that was far warmer, warmer to material enrichment. Here too, however, we need a qualification. Mendelssohn did not believe that the accumulation of wealth was inherently bad. It could in fact be quite noble, depending on the intentions and objectives. At the same time, Mendelssohn does not have a problem, does not have a program, I'm sorry, to resolve this modern challenge. Nowhere does he lay out his solutions systematically. One is left, as I have done, as I'm trying to do, detecting a thread woven into the fabric of his thoughts, showing itself in different colors at different points. Perhaps this is because, as I've said, Mendelssohn is, is caught in the middle. It's not a problem that can easily be solved. One can surmise that Mendelssohn is just throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks. But I think rather for a mind that is as clear as Mendelssohn's, he recognizes we must pursue various different avenues, and he's trying to figure out how the human being, and the Jew specifically, can thrive in his freedom, the freedom of modernity. Thus, I take Mendelssohn's mixed approach to the, to the material conditions of modernity as representative as a gen, of a general dialecticism regarding enlightenment progress, a tendency that's often missed or underappreciated by readers of Mendelssohn. Professor Feiner has done us a great favor by making accessible Mendelssohn's great work, Jerusalem in Hebrew, and through offering us as well his unique interpretation of it as a revolutionary work fighting fanaticism, prejudice, and authoritarianism, impulses which seem to reemerge throughout history and which can be seen as well today. Thank you.
Okay, so now we have time for some questions and answers. Uh, Marcus, you're gonna go. I'm addressing this to Professor Fina. Okay, now? How do you explain what has received a lot of attention, and that is the direction that Mendelssohn's children took? That is, the, um, their tendency toward conversion, and um, what's, it, what's the context in which that all happened? Um, I think his uh, grandson, Felix, actually had more respect for Moses Mendelssohn. And there are um, musicologists who have shown that his work was essentially Jewish rather than Christian, although his parents had converted him when he was seven years old. But the question, therefore, has to do with Mendelssohn's ch own children. <clears throat> okay. Um, the question about Mendelssohn children uh, is something that uh, um, goes along is uh, image and stereotype uh, for many, many years. Uh, and the reason, uh, and this is one of the reasons why there is no street named after Moses Mendelssohn in Jerusalem. Not just because, as uh, Professor Gottlieb mentioned, Slovenian uh, nationalist criticism of uh, Mendelssohn, but maybe also uh, the rejection of the orthodox, mainly the ultra-orthodox of Moses Mendelssohn, um, which in their mind is the arch enemy of religion, of Judaism. And uh, as we, we know from almost the very beginning, just a few years after uh, he passed away, and even during his lifetime, Manson found himself at the midst of the Jewish cultural camp until this very day. Um, and we have the contradicting images of Mendelssohn. From one hand, coming from German Jewish tradition, he is described as the great hero who uh, saved Jews from the Dark Ages and led them into uh, the light and the new world of enlightenment and emancipation and everything which is modern. And on the other hand, this uh, image, again, of uh, the uh, secular assimilationist uh, Jew who uh, became uh, the symbol of uh, all the terrible trends that happened, uh, that uh, uh, were taken by Jews uh, from the 18th century uh, onwards. And of course, all those uh, views are um, more kind of myth than historical reality. And one of the um, tasks of historian is to depict him in his historical context and try to understand him via his writings, uh, even personal letters. And then we understand, and I try to do it in my short biography of Moses Mendelssohn, and Alexander Altman actually did it in his monumental uh, classical biography uh, to contradict all those uh, stereotypes. So this is a short but important introduction to answer your, your question. Um, Man Mendelssohn and his wife, Fromet, also important. Fromet, uh, Mendelssohn and Moses Mendelssohn and his wife, Fromet, uh, Guggenha Guggenheim, uh, now she has not a role, but she has a, um, a plot in Berlin, if 
front of the, the Jewish Museum in, in Berlin, the Promet uh, and Promet und Moses, Promet and Moses uh, Madison Park, this is, okay. Uh, so they had 10 children, only six survived, that was uh, the weight of uh, uh, children uh, uh, mortality at the time. And Mendelssohn passed away, we just heard, uh, because he didn't listen to format and he rushed out at late, late December, December 1785 without wearing a coat and then he uh, got some pneumonia and he died just a few days later. Why most of the children, the six children, uh, were still young and uh, only one was married, the, uh, the oldest daughter, uh, Brendel, who became uh, Dorothea. So the children, as all parents in this audience know, they have their own way. Uh, they don't follow necessarily their parents. Uh, they are influenced by a different climate and uh, and that's what really what happened to uh, the children. Uh, six uh, out of the six uh, uh, children, four converted, as you said, in a certain phase in, in their life. If you just take, uh, for example, Brenda became Dorothea, she married a Jewish uh, uh, person uh, uh, during her uh, uh, father's uh, time and they had uh, two children, and then uh, she decided to leave her, uh, uh, her husband and divorce him, that was after Moses Mendelssohn's death, and uh, she fell in love with a romantic uh, author, philosopher, famous uh, Friedrich, uh, Friedrich Schlegel. They lived together, and then she converted and they uh, married, and then they converted again, both of them, and became Catholic. So, uh, and if you, you want to understand uh, Dorothea, uh, there is, uh, the Moses Mendes of Jerusalem is not part of the story, it was not part of the, of the context, she was independent, she was intelligent, she, she was intellectual, she actually wrote the first uh, novel, written by a Jewish woman, and by the way, this, uh, this novel from 1801, Florentine, uh, uh, written and published in, in German, is now being translated into Hebrew, it will be published very, very soon. Uh, the same publication, uh, pu publisher that published uh, uh, Jerusalem, so we take care of the Mendelssohn uh, family from uh, all from several directions. Uh, so uh, uh, that, that means that uh, there is really no connection between Mendelssohn and Diaz and what happened to the children. I don't want to be an apologetic I, uh, and speak for Moses Mendelssohn. I'm sure that it, uh, uh, for him uh, it was a terrible thing that she converted. Uh, and the, the other three uh, children, because all his life he was challenged by uh, uh, German uh, scholars and clergymen uh, from the Swiss Lavater uh, to, uh, to Kranz, who, who was actually, that was the challenge for writing in Jerusalem. He believed that uh, um, if you are uh, a Jew, um, you are in a certain way superior to the Christian religion. It was very difficult for him to uh, express it freely, but uh, if we read sometimes, uh, openly sometimes, between the lines, we understand that he believes that, uh, 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 that Christianity is not above, but something is, is kind of inferior religion than, uh, than Judaism, and he uh, also believes as uh, a believer, uh, believer Jew, that in Revelation, in the Revelation from Sinai, he believed that there is no way to change anything in Jewish law without a second revelation, meaning that he was a 
kind of orthodox, even fundamentalist, if we uh, taking into our own uh, terms of uh, of today. So uh, the story of the children is a different story, and it belongs to a different period in German Jewish history, uh, mainly to uh, the age of Romanticism and less to the age of Aufklärung, of the Enlightenment. I'm not sure which of you to um, ask this question of, or if it is totally appropriate. However, I would love to know how Maimonides and Mendelssohn understood, from a metaphysical point of view, the word soul. Big question, I know. If it's possible to give me a simple answer. I love that question. The question was, how does Mendelssohn understand the soul? Yeah. Did you, did you say Maimonides also? Both of them. How do you understand Maimonides and how do you understand the soul? Time permitting. <laughs> right. How much? Right. So, uh, no. But, so the soul, I'll just say. Uh, the soul is very is simple. So I took the easy side. The Mendelssohn was very much an Enlightenment thinker, and he believed in natural religion. And for and for Mendelssohn, that that what are his central truths that he names in Jerusalem are God, the belief in God, not necessarily defined in an institutional kind of way, or what we might what we might now think of a denominational kind of way. God exists. God's providence. God works in the world, and that the soul is immortal. So that the soul. In, when the body dies, returns to the immortal understanding of God's etern eternality, which is not at all contradictory to the way that traditional Judaism understands the soul. It's cast in enlightenment terms in a particular way. It, and he is very much the intellectual heir to not just Maimonides, but also to Spinoza, both of whom I think think the same way from very different sides of, of a similar coin. I think the question was also what Maimonides thought about the soul, right? Um, so just in brief as well, um, first of all, just the word soul, the word that's translated into soul is also the word for mind um, and, and intellect um, in certain kinds of ways. And so it's just we have to be careful. Sorry? Meaning just in, in the pre-modern period, just more broadly, I would say, in, 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 in many different languages, okay, the, these, the words mind and soul are interchangeable terms. And so that's just something we have to keep in mind as well when we're asking these questions because we're thinking in our terms, but these are terms that mean different things. But just in brief, Maimonides, all, Maimonides believe that human beings have um, a body, um, which is material, and then we have a soul that um, has different kind of aspects to it, some that are more um, linked to the parts, to the functioning of the body, and then um, other parts that are more rational or more connected to um, our moral perfection. And ultimately, Maimonides um, thought that what we needed to do was to work on perfecting our rational soul and our, mor and the mor our moral virtues, which was perfecting um, the moral part of our soul, and he believe that people who did this work will ultimately get to keep um, enjoying the fruits of that in after death. And I, I think, I, I mean, you might have been thinking about what I mentioned in one of the quotations where Maimonides thought that certain extreme sinners don't have this benefit of the immortality of the soul or get cut off. So this is kind of its own separate topic, this, the, the cutting off of the soul. Um, which I, I'll just kind of say is a longer conversation, um, but that's a little bit about what my mom thought about the soul. Right, thank you. So I'm going to use my my prerogative as the uh, the moderator to keep it going because uh, we're coming towards the end of our program, and I want to have a chance to uh, to hear from Professor J. J. Schachter, who will be offering a uh, concluding reflection.
As the uh, concluding reflector, I want to begin by to thank the Leo Beck Institute and its leadership, uh, to thank Mirza uh, Hashem to be Professor John Green, and Baruch uh, Hashem already Professor Micha Gottlieb for all the work that was done to put together this conference. It's been a real privilege for me to appear on the same podium with my distinguished panelists, with Professor Billet, Professor Hachman, and uh, Professor uh, Gottlieb. I want to acknowledge the presence of Mrs. Finer, who is here. Could you raise your hand, please? Mrs. Finer, who is here. Um, it's a real honor and a privilege to have you uh, in our audience. And I also want to acknowledge the presence of one of my teachers from whom I have learned so much, and that is Professor Ismar Shorsh, who graces us uh, with his presence, one of the giants of uh, modern Jewish history, early modern Jewish history, and a great Jewish leader. I want to thank Professor Feiner. Um, I, I don't know how many of you know that we are here in the presence of an incredible scholar with an amazing range of knowledge. Um, we could fill a library with the books that he has written, uh, translated into all kinds of languages, and the dozens, probably by now well over 100 articles. Uh, we have a communal debt to Professor Feiner, and I want to take the opportunity to express a personal hakarat hatov. Uh, I do my academic work in early modern Jewish history, and I have benefited just enormously from all of the work of Prof Professor Feiner, including uh, this work that we celebrate uh, today. What I've learned from him is, is a lot, and not just in terms of the factual information, but there are two contexts that I think he has uh, enlightened us all on. One is that he brings Jewish history in a world context. Um, he did it in the lecture this afternoon, the Declaration of Independence, the French Revolution, Lessing and Dome, and he does it in all of his works to frame what's going on in the Jewish world in the context of what's going on in the general world. And also, he brings the role of women uh, at the forefront, well into the forefront of the Jewish historical story. And he did it again today when Frumet uh, Mendelssohn appeared as a very central figure uh, in response to a question that he was asked. And uh, so we, we're, we're in the presence of, of greatness, and uh, we all express our gratitude to you, Professor Feiner, for your ongoing work. HaKadosh Baruch Hu should give you the strength and the good health to continue to enlighten all of us for many, many, many wonderful years to come, together with your great wife and your wonderful family. At the end of the day, you know it's about family. You know this genius and scholarship is incredible, but at the end of the day, family really matters, and uh, it's important to me. It's a great deal to be said, but I want to conclude with uh, a reason why I think that Jerusalem is an incredibly important and relevant uh, book for us today, and why it resonates for me at this particular moment in the unfolding of the uh, Jewish journey. In the contemporary Jewish community, the pendulum has shifted and Mendelssohn's position has carried the day. Mendelssohn has won. Western culture at large and wide swaths of contemporary Jewish community feature personal autonomy and individual choice. There are no sumptuary laws, there is no coercion, there is no cherem, there is no religious overarching power, there is no excommunication, there are no Rabbi Raphael Cohen's pretty much in the broad range of the contemporary Jewish community. We are all Netanel Posner's, or maybe virtually all of us. And I quote from today's presentation, Posner's fashionable clothing, his clean-shaven face, his attendance at the theater and in balls were regarded as testimony to, quote, free thought 
and contempt for the religion. It doesn't have to necessarily be contempt for the religion, but it's free thought, and that is really the core of what contemporary Jewish life um, looks like. Mendelssohn wrote that we heard this morning, this afternoon, let everyone be permitted to speak as he thinks. He said he, today we would say he and she, or maybe we would say she. Let everyone be permitted to speak as she thinks, to invoke God after her own manner or that of her fathers, and to seek eternal salvation where he or she thinks she or he may find it. That's our story, as long as she or he does not disturb public felicity and acts honestly toward the civil lords and towards each one of us. So this is the reality. And so the question that I'm left with and that I'd like you to consider and that I want to leave you with is uh, how do we make a case, given that Mendelssohn won and the arguments of Jerusalem have carried the day, for a commitment to Judaism out of choice? What does the word mitzvah mean today? What does commandedness, is there such a thing as commandedness that comes out of choice? And the challenge is visible when one realizes the decisions that his children made. And we heard about this just a moment ago. Whether he was happy about it, he probably wasn't happy about it. We heard that he wasn't happy about it. But is this an inevitable choice, an inevitable outcome of this kind of a perspective. How do we sing the sheer of Judaism? Professor Achman, I love that phrase that you invoked. How do we sing the sheer of Judaism in a world where any choice is not only available, but is actually welcomed and uh, respected? And finally, how do we construct a contemporary Judaism that will allow maybe someday a street in the city of Jerusalem to be named after the author of a book entitled Jerusalem. Thank you all for coming. It's been really a pleasure. Thank you to the panelists and thank you to the audience. Uh, so um, just a few concluding remarks. Uh, I think this has been a, a fantastic panel. I, I think what's very clear is how everyone is really uh, in the debt to Professor Feiner for his work, for his, um, we're all real students of Professor Feiner. I think anyone who works on German Judaism is a student of Professor Feiner's. Um, and that's very clear here. People here, people throughout the field, and I know how much I have learned um, about Haskalah, and certainly my work would be much poorer if I uh, didn't, uh, hadn't learned so much from, from you. Um, and I think it's uh, very, very fitting that, you know, at this point in your career, you come to share a, a Hebrew translation of Jerusalem with the world. So thank you very, very much. Um, and so, and just one kind of final thought is, you know, Mendelssohn ends his Jerusalem with uh, quoting the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah. He says, uh, the, the Hebrew is ha'emet ve'ashalom ahevo, and he translates it as love truth, love peace. Um, and I think that's in some ways a real kind of encapsulation of Mendelssohn's philosophy. You say, if you just say, give me Mendelssohn's philosophy in four words, that's what I would say it is. Love truth, love peace, because these are kind of two sides uh, that might seem to be in contradiction with each other. When one really can, feels that one is correct, and right, one's inclination is often to fight, to oppose the other. And so then the prophet uh, and Mendelssohn tells you, don't just love truth, love peace. And when you love peace, your inclination may be to, well, just let's paper over differences and let's just get along. And so Mendelssohn says, love truth. Um, and so I think that's really a kind of fitting summary of his, of his thought. And we've really learned so much from the responses to, uh, to Professor Feiner's work. Um, and I really want to thank all the panelists and Professor Feiner for their really enlightening words. So thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it.